Thank you for being here with us today. I'm so glad to see all of you, and uh, it is going to be a great day today. Well, we're in this series called The Lamb, The Lion, and The Warrior King, and we're going through the book of Revelation. That's a very interesting book for many people. And we learned uh, the first week that it's all about Jesus. And if we're going to understand this book, and get the blessing from it. God does promise a blessing. Actually, these are the words of Jesus that he promises a blessing to anyone that reads it, to anyone that hears it, and to everyone that keeps it. That is keeping it at the center of your life. And what we've learned is that the blessing from this is keeping the gospel of Jesus Christ at the center of your life. And, and what that means is that you live your life with the understanding that Jesus is with you. He's in control. And no matter what you go through, He's there. And then uh, the second week, last week, we learned about how to stir up your passion for Jesus Christ. Because all of us, from time to time, will lose our passion. We feel like we grow cold. And the Bible tells us that Jesus gave these admonitions to seven real churches. And the first uh, church last week we looked at was the church at Ephesus. And Jesus said, you've lost your first love. And so he, he commended them. He corrected them. He gave them a way to fix it. And he gave them a blessing. And so today we're going to look at the second church. We're going to look at the church of Smyrna. Now, once again, these were the words of Jesus. And these were seven real churches in what today would be called Turkey, modern-day Turkey. These were in Asia Minor, and he starts with Ephesus, and he makes a clockwise circle around that region and talks to these seven churches. So there are seven real letters that were written to seven real churches, and every one of these were verbatim from Jesus Christ himself. Now, today we're going to talk about when life does not turn out like you expect. And the reason we're talking about this in this way is because of what the church at Smyrna went through. Now, understand that in most all of these seven letters to these churches, there's actually technically one letter to all the seven churches, but in, in the admonitions that Jesus gives to all seven churches, Smyrna is the only one that he does not say, hey, I've got somewhat against you. In other words, there's something you need to correct. And he deals a little differently with this church. And I believe the reason is because of what they were going through. Life did not turn out like they expected. In fact, many of the people in this church were being persecuted. And in fact, many of them were going to be put to death. And Jesus told them, he said, this tribulation is coming. And so these were people that had received Christ. They were living for him. And yet, they were in, going to end up suffering greatly for their faith. Life did not turn out like they expected. Now, all of us know what that's like. If you've lived for more than a few years, then you know that sometimes life disappoints. Sometimes life throws a curveball. I can remember when I was a teenager and uh, I ate like a human vacuum cleaner. Um, I, I was into sports and I was really, really skinny, same height uh, since 14, uh, but not the same weight since 14. And so I can remember in one of the times that I was eating so very much, my dad looked at me, and said, now, son, you need to watch what you're eating. He's because one day you're going to gain weight. And I remember very specifically that I laughed. I mocked. I said to my dad, there's no way that I'm ever going to struggle with my weight. And like Gomer Pyle said on the Andy Griffith Show, surprise, surprise, right? Now we can talk about waistlines and hairlines. You know, there are things that turn out physically that you didn't expect. The older you get, you know, I'm kind of like, uh, anytime I bend over now, I think, what else do I need to do while I'm down here so I don't have to do this again? But the truth is, we all have things that change in life and things that we're not expecting. It comes with jobs, it comes with health, it comes with loss, sometimes even loss of family members, loss of loved ones. 
And every person in this room, if you have not experienced this kind of loss, you will one day. And so all of us know what it's like to deal with the way that life turns out in a way that we don't expect. And so this is what Jesus, I believe, was telling this church and how he was encouraging them to get through these difficult times. So let's read. This is the church at Smyrna, Revelation chapter 2, verse 8. And to the angel, we learned last week, that word is angelos in Greek, and it means messenger, and it's referring to the pastor of the church. And he's saying to the pastor of the church, give them this message. That's what he's saying. He is actually admonishing the pastor to preach this word from the very lips of Jesus. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. If you'll notice in every one of these churches that Jesus addresses, he says something like this. The city of Smyrna, you know what they were famous for? You know what they claimed about themselves? They had had great economic difficulty and the city, they said, died. But then through uh, some of the leadership and so forth, they came up with ideas and the, the city came back to life economically. So they claim to be the city that died and came back to life. But in every one of these churches that Jesus talks about, to every one of these cities, he says something that that city claimed. And he says, no, 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 no. I'm the one that died and came back to life. I'm the real deal. I am the resurrection and the life. He said, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. And he's referring here to a group of people that were Jewish and they had not converted to Christianity and they were making it difficult for the Jewish Christians that had converted to Christianity. In fact, they were making it so difficult. They were slandering them, lying about them, making up things like saying that they were cannibals because they took the Lord's Supper or communion and and all of this stuff. So they were increasing persecution by their slander. But Jesus said, you're rich, really. Uh, He said, do not fear what you are about to suffer. Words of encouragement, right? Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Well, that's good news. Jesus, we had hoped that you would deliver us from this, but you're saying that I'm about to suffer something. How many of you know that life happens? And no matter what kind of life, you may have a charmed life, you may have a blessed life, and all of us that are followers of Jesus Christ, we are blessed, but sometimes life happens. And any preacher that tries to tell you that if you're really a good Christian and you have enough faith, that you're never, ever going to have any trials, you're never, ever going to suffer, is lying to you. Jesus said, do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. And for 10 days, I'm going to come back and explain that to you in a moment. For 10 days, you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death. He's saying some of you are going to have tribulation. Some of you are even going to die for your faith. Some of you are going to have trials up to the point that you die. You may not be a martyr, but you're going to experience difficulties in life. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. Now, you notice a pattern in every one of these admonitions that Jesus gives to the seven churches, normally, and not quite in this letter, or to to the church at Smyrna, but normally he says, this is what you're doing well. I'm proud of you. You ought to know that Jesus loves you. You ought to know that Jesus is proud of you when you follow him. He he loves you. And yeah, you make mistakes, and yeah, you uh, fall short, but he says, man, you're doing great. Understand that. But then he says, hey, there's some things you need to correct. And who of us in this room doesn't need to correct something in our life? Who of us in this room doesn't need to get better in some area of our life? And then what he does, he does not judge them because he's already taken the judgment of God on the cross for us. But he says, here's the way to get better. 
He encourages them to repent. The word repent means to agree with God, to change your mind. He says, you need to agree with me. Here's a way to get better. And then he promises a blessing. He promises a future blessing at the end of everyone to, of what he says to every one of these churches. He says, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear. This is your spiritual ear. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. Well, I want to give you three thoughts on how you can be ready when life does not turn out like you expected. Here's the first thing. Remember why you trust Jesus. Now, I got to tell you, you're going to face difficulty. You're going to face trials. It's inevitable. The best of us, the one that has the best life. And look, let's be honest for a second. We live in a country and in a culture where we have incredible blessings. We have, I mean, we're a first world country. There are people in the world today that are worrying because they have no place to live. They have no shelter over their heads. They have no food for tomorrow. They don't know if they're going to be able to feed their children today. There are millions and actually billions of people around the world. It's said that over half of the world's population lives on less than a dollar a day. Can we acknowledge we're, we've got first world problems? You know what I'm saying? I mean, the fact is many people in the world are worried about dying overnight. They're worried about what they're going to eat in the morning. And we get upset because our internet doesn't quite go as fast as we like. And yes, we have problems. And yes, we're going to face difficulties. But when you do, the way to get through this is to remember why you trusted Jesus in the first place. You see, when you remember why, it helps you get through. When you remember why you trusted him, it helps you get through what you're going through. And he gave them several clues about why they should trust him here in this text. He said that he's God. He said, I'm the resurrection and the life. He is God Almighty. Thank God we can trust Jesus because he is God. He knows more than we do. He sees more than we do. We trust him because he's God. We trust him because he's eternal. I love the fact that Jesus is eternal. Let me kind of explain this to you so you understand. It doesn't just mean that he lives forever. It means that he is outside of time and space. So in other words, God sees your life and he's not waiting 50 years to see the end of your life. He already sees it. He's outside of time and space. He sees, he said that in, in earlier, what we read uh, last week or the week before, he said basically that he was uh, throughout all of history. He was before our time. He is during our time and he will be after our time. So it isn't like, he's not waiting for 2000 years since he went back to heaven to see what's gonna happen tomorrow. He already knows, he already sees, he is outside of time and space. He is eternal and he has made choices for your life, for your blessing that are best for you. He's eternal. We can trust him. We know that he is God Almighty. He's the one who conquered death. That's good news. Not only did Jesus resurrect from the dead after he died on the cross for our sin, but he promised that all who believe in him will one day be resurrected to live in a glorified, resurrected body with him forever. That's good news. And hey, let me just tell you, there are some things that I'm looking forward to about that. You know what I mean? I mean, I'm looking forward to not having any aches and pains. I'm looking forward to eating at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Uh, the Bible says that it's going to be the best food, the best wine, the best uh, kind of ambiance. It is going to be incredible. I'm looking forward to that resurrected body like Jesus had that's not limited by time or space. It is a body. We'll be able to eat and touch and feel and talk, but it's going to be a time where there is no more sorrow, no more pain, no more tears. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. He conquered death. Jesus knows. Whatever you're going through, he knows. I love 
what the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, talking about Jesus Christ. Listen to what it says about him. It says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. You see, you and I often don't understand the, the ramifications of that statement that Jesus Christ knows. He's been through what we've been through. He knows rejection. He knows pain. He knows sorrow. He knows death. He knows loss. So no matter what you've gone through, He knows. And not only does He know, He can sympathize with you. He can empathize with you. And He tells us that with confidence... Not with doubt, but with confidence, we can come boldly to God, boldly to Him in our time of need, and He's going to give us grace. Let me tell you how grace works. Grace is God's unmerited, unearned kindness and favor. It's not something that we get because we did something that makes us deserve it, but God gives it freely. But grace sometimes delivers us, delivers us from the problem, and sometimes it delivers us through the problem. The Apostle Paul wrote about that, and he talked about that three times he prayed that God would remove his thorn in the flesh. Some scholars believe it was a physical ailment of some kind. Some scholars believe that it was a person that was just a thorn in his flesh, and everywhere he went, this person tried to stop him. But you know what God said to him? He said, my grace is sufficient. Now, we can trust him because he knows, he sees, he knows more than we do. So when you're going through difficulty, don't be disturbed. Don't be bothered because we know that Jesus knows. When I was about seven years old, my family moved from North Carolina, where all my family was from, where I grew up. And we moved for about two years to Spartanburg, South Carolina. We eventually moved back to North Carolina, but my dad's job moved him. And, and while we were there, my parents bought this uh, big tract of land, about nine acres, and, and they built a house. And it was wonderful. It was out in the country. We were right next to a peach orchard. And uh, it was back uh, roads in the country. And I remember that occasionally our whole family, my mom, my sister, my dad, and me, we would go ride bikes because there were very few cars that were on the roads. It was pretty safe. And I remember being about eight years old, maybe. And um, I was very competitive, and so I wanted to beat everybody. It was easy to beat my sister. It was pretty easy to beat my mom, but I was really going to have to work to beat my dad. And in fact, I couldn't beat him, but I was trying. So I'm pedaling, and I'm laughing, and, and I'm looking back over my shoulder. I'm not looking where I'm going. And I'm kind of taunting my dad. I'm, I'm like, nah, 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 you know, and he's like, all of a sudden, I saw him start to pedal with everything in him. I thought he's just going to race me. And he's screaming at me like he's angry. And I'm like, what a jerk. You know, I, mean, I can't believe it. I'm just trying to ride bikes. And here he is doing this. And in fact, my dad very quickly caught up with me and ran into me, an eight-year-old kid. He was a grown man. He knocked me off of my bike onto the side of the road. And I jumped up and I was upset. I was crying. Why did you do something like that? And little did I realize that because I was not looking, I was headed directly toward a car that was going to run me over. Coming around a curve, my dad saw it. I did not see it. And so what I thought was cruelty on my dad's part, what I thought was unkind on my dad's part, was exactly what I needed. Can I tell you this? Your heavenly father sees a whole lot more than my dad did. He knows what's around every corner, every curve. He knows what happens tomorrow. And sometimes the things that we are going through are exactly what we need. Why do we trust him? Well, because he wins. And we need to remember that. So when you're going through life's difficulties, when you're going through problems and it doesn't turn out quite like you thought, remember that Jesus wins. This is why we trust him. Here's the second thing. 
You don't need to compare your life with others. Now, this is where discontentment comes often in our lives. In fact, it is very prominent in our culture today. In fact, one of the things that social scientists say about the culture that we live in, there's a great suicide rate among young people. There's a great dissatisfaction with everything in life, particularly with young girls, with their bodies and with the way they look and all this kind of stuff. And even among young boys, um, and, and even in young adults, they, they, there are more people on antidepressants now than ever in the history of the world. And some social scientists say that part of it is because of social media. You know what social media is good for? I mean, there are some good things about social media. Don't get me wrong. I'm not suggesting you shouldn't have a phone. But you know what happens often and probably most of the time on social media is we compare. We look at somebody that has filtered their pictures and made their life look like it was awesome on the beach. And they got the family that's perfectly dressed in white and they're all together and they're smiling. And you're like, man, I wish my family could do that. But, but my family, I can't even get my kids to stand still for a picture, you know? And you don't realize that they almost got a divorce on the way to the beach. They threatened to physically harm their children if they didn't stand still. And they got that perfect picture after 82 tries. And they kind of edited it a little bit so that it looked perfect. And you know what happens to us? We compare. We compare our life with others. And we start saying, well, why don't I get to do what they're doing? Or why is this happening to me and it didn't happen to them? I believe that often we compare our lives and it causes detriment to our faith. The church at Smyrna, they had financial challenges. I shared with you earlier about the Jews that slandered them. They actually, because they didn't worship the emperor, were excluded from many normal business deals. The Greek word that we read, he, Jesus said, you've got poverty. It's actually the same root word that he used in the Beatitudes. Remember what Jesus said? He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. You know what that means? That word poor, it's not the working poor. It's not the poor that says, you know, if I miss work or if I miss a paycheck, I'm going to get in trouble financially. That, that's not what he's talking about. That word poor is abject poverty, both financially, emotionally, and physically. In other words, that word was used to describe the people that were poor in that day, but not only were they poor, they were physically incapable of working. Often they were crippled, sometimes they were blind, but they had no way of supporting themselves. And that word poor was used to describe them because if someone else did not help them, they would die. And do you know that that is the attitude that you and I must use when we come to God? That's why Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. He's not suggesting that you have to walk around with your lip hanging out and your head down. That's not what he means. It means that you recognize that apart from God, there is no hope for you. But when you realize that and you turn to Jesus Christ, you go from being poor in spirit to absolutely rich in the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus said. He said, you're poor, but you're really rich. He was reminding them of their salvation. He was reminding them that even though some of their outlook didn't look too good, that they had a future in heaven. That's what he was reminding them about. And he was saying, don't compare. You see, God is trustworthy no matter what happens. Now, we read where it said, you're going to be tested for 10 days. And let me tell you what that means. There's two things that it refers to. One is in that culture, actually, uh, in that culture, uh, I believe that Smyrna was the capital for capital punishment. It's where many people were killed. They claimed, you know, hey, we got this sword or whatever. And um, so often these people, Christians, would be tested for 10 days. In other words, they would be arrested. And then for 10 days, they would be tortured. And they would give them 10 days to repent and to say, Jesus is not Lord, 
but the emperor is God. But many of these Christians refused to bow to the emperor to say that the emperor was God, and their faith kept them from doing this. And then after 10 days, they'd be put to death. So that's one thing that it referred to. The other thing is, and many scholars believe this, this was a reference to the book of Daniel. Now, this is where we get this idea of comparison, because I'm going to show you what Jesus said to this church. In the book of Daniel, you remember the story of how the Israelites were captured and taken captivity into captivity by the Babylonian army. They were conquered, and it was many of the royal family, the nobility that were taken, including four names that we know, which were Daniel, you remember Daniel, Daniel the lion's den, and then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That was their Babylonian names. They were the ones cast in the fiery furnace. Their Hebrew names were Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Okay. Now, if you recall, when they were captured, these were young men. They were not very old. Uh, and the king had put them uh, to someone that was in charge of them. Uh, and basically, they were to eat of the king's table for 10 days. For 10 days. Now, interestingly, in that culture, when you ate at the king's table, you know what it meant? It meant that you, wor- because he provided for you, it meant that you worshiped him and recognized him as God. And so when Daniel and ha- uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, hey, we're not going to do this. Let us eat from our normal Jewish dietary laws. It wasn't just that they were against eating pork. It's that they were trusting God to deliver them, and they were not going to say that Nebuchadnezzar was God, but they worshiped the one true God. That's what they were saying. And you know the story, at the end of the 10 days, they looked better than the other people, and they were promoted. In fact, throughout the first part of the book of Daniel, they were promoted over the years to incredibly powerful positions. Daniel eventually became what will be equivalent of almost like a prime minister. He literally served about five or six different kings, which was highly unusual in that time because normally when a new king took over, a new regime took over, they killed uh, the people that were in the previous uh, king's service. And so Daniel, and then of course Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were elevated to lofty political and powerful positions. And yet we know that they were tested later. Daniel was thrown in the lion's den but he wasn't killed. God delivered them, delivered him. He sent an angel to shut the lion's mouth. Isn't that incredible? I love that story. Then, of course, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they refused to bow to the king and worship his 90-foot-tall golden image. They said, we're not going to do it. And he threw them into a fiery furnace. It was so hot that it literally killed the soldiers that threw them in And then after the flame died down, they should have been dead. They should have been burnt to a crisp. They should have been gone. But the king goes and looks and he says, did we not throw three in? He said, behold, I see four. And the fourth one looks like the son of God, which it was. It was Jesus with them. Now, why would Jesus tell a church that was getting ready to die for their faith. Why would he remind them of the book of Daniel? Why would he say to them, be faithful, you're going to suffer. In fact, some of you are going to die. Why would he do that? I believe it's for this reason. Because we cannot compare our life with others. Because here's what I know. For many of us, We may look at somebody else's life and think they've got it better than we do or easier than we do, but God has a plan. Sometimes he delivers from a fiery furnace. Sometimes he delivers from the mouth of lions. And sometimes you'll die for your faith. Sometimes he will not deliver you from it, but he'll deliver you through it. And the very interesting thing is what Jesus told them was that they should not compare their lives for others. Why is that? Why does he tell us this? I believe for three reasons, because all of our suffering is for three reasons. Number one, our suffering and our problems and our tribulation brings glory uh, to God, and it's it's for God's purpose for our life. So it's for God's glory and God's purpose. 
We must understand that. God's glory and God's purpose. Now, what was God's purpose with the uh, with Daniel and the uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which was different than this church. I'll tell you, and it's not in Scripture, but I believe we can read and understand this. The purpose was in the Old Testament that it was that eventually God was going to bring uh, the uh, Israelites back to their land, and God needed leaders to promote this so that that could happen. In fact, it was later that there were actually some of the uh, kings in the book of Daniel that we believe turned to Christ and they allowed the Israelites to come back. So God preserved them, but why did he not preserve the people at the church at Smyrna? Well, I believe one of the reasons is that this eventually caused what is called the diaspora, the, the spreading of the Jewish people, and these were Jewish Christians, and it literally spread the gospel around the world. Two different things, two different purposes, both brought glory to God. So whenever you're going through something and you're like, well, you know, my loved one died. Why did that happen? Well, I've shared many times with you about my sister-in-law and how that she is 41 years old, an incredible Christian. She died of cancer. We prayed for her. We believed that God was going to deliver her. We believed that God was going to heal her. And he did by taking her home to heaven. And the reason I believe that God allowed this to happen was because that is the event that caused her husband to turn to Christ, my wife's older brother. And today he's a born again believer. Today he serves God with all of his heart and his kids. He raised them to follow Jesus Christ. And I know this, Lisa died for God's purpose and God's glory. And if she had a choice, if she knew that it took her death to reach her husband for Christ, she would do it 100 times out of 100. Now, I don't know what God's purpose is in your suffering, but I do know this, he'll get glory if you don't compare your life to others and if you trust him. The second thing is all of our sufferings are for our growth and our benefit. I know that sometimes, well, always it's painful. We don't like it, nobody likes to suffer, but often God uses it to grow us and to make us better. And I, I've been a physical living example of that. Long story short, I ended up going to the Mayo Clinic. They told me what I had, this um, thing that they didn't really know. It's called radiculopathy. And I know that sounds ridiculous, but it's actually what it's called. And uh, I ended up two years ago, well, 18 months ago, I was in bed. I lost 60 pounds in two months. I literally thought I was going to die. The church thought I was going to die. My wife thought I was going to die. And thank God that I began to get better. How many believe God heals? How many believe God heals? But, but let me tell you how God heals, okay? Let me tell you how God heals. Sometimes He heals medically. Don't take that for granted. Do what the doctor tells you. If you've got diabetes, take your medicine, change your diet, exercise. God can heal you medically. Sometimes he heals naturally. In my case, that's what's happening. They had no medicine to give me to make me better. And, and over that period of time, and I'm walking now, I can walk three or four miles. I work out about four days a week. Um, only problem is I gained 60 pounds at all back. And, but the point is this, God is healing me. I believe that in not too awful long that you won't even notice any limp at all that I'm gonna be 100% healed, okay? Sometimes God heals naturally. Okay, he'll use your body. And then sometimes he heals supernaturally. I've seen people in this church that had cancer and God healed them. We prayed for them, God healed them. Sometimes he does that. And sometimes, listen, he heals permanently. You say, what do you mean by that? You do realize that any physical healing in this life is only temporary. I mean, you can get healed of cancer. You can be 20 years old and healed of cancer, and guess what? Even if it never comes back, there's going to be a day that you die because you've got a physical body, okay? And death entered the world because of sin. The only way you'll escape it is if Jesus comes back before you die, okay? And then you'll be changed and you'll have a, a glorified, resurrected body, okay? But every one of us, 100% of us, guess what? We don't get out of this life alive. It happens to every one of us. And so sometimes he heals permanently by taking us to heaven. That's how he heals us, okay? And, and it's not a bad way to be healed. And so uh, then the last thing about our suffering is that it's always temporary 
It's always temporary. You say, well, it doesn't seem temporary to me. It's been going on for a long time. You do realize that there is coming a day that you'll stop breathing on this globe and you'll start breathing in heaven. Okay? So it's temporary. It's temporary. The last thing, just wait because it gets better. Just wait. Whatever you're going through, just wait. It gets better. Most of the time, these things pass. Most of the time, we get through these things. But even if it costs you your life, it gets better. Because we get to go to heaven when we die. And I don't have time to read a lot of things that I've written down here. But let me just read you 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8. Paul said, I have fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. I've finished the uh, race. I've kept the faith for me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. And then Jesus said in John chapter 16, verse 33, I've said these things to you that in me, you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. That's a fact. In the world, you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. So whatever you're going through, Jesus has overcome it. Just wait. It gets better. B.R. Lakin, one of the great preachers of the 20th century, was preaching on heaven. And he was talking about that we are like soldiers in the army of the Lord. And that one day when we die, we'll go to heaven. I want you to listen to this quote that he said. On that day that he dies, he was looking forward to going to heaven. He was looking forward to meeting Jesus. Here's what he said. And on that day, I will march up to the gate and I will hang my sword on the shimmering wall of the city of God. Oh, you're doing battle. You're going through battles. You're going through tribulations. You're going through difficulty. But one day, you'll get to hang your sword on the shimmering wall of the city of God. And then I close with this quote from D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody was the great 19th century uh, preacher. He was a revivalist. And he was dying. He had seen tens of thousands of people come to know Christ. He had preached on heaven many times. And on his deathbed, his son was with him. And he recorded, he recorded his last words. And here's what D.L. Moody said. Earth recedes. Heaven opens before me. If this is death, it is sweet. There is no valley here. God is calling me. And I must go. And his son told him, he said, Dad, you're dreaming. Be quiet. And he said, no, I'm not dreaming. I've been within the gates. I've seen the children's faces. This is my triumph. This is my coronation day. And ladies and gentlemen, just wait, because it gets better. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, one day, when you taste that sweet taste of death is sweet for the believer when they get to heaven, when they cross the Jordan to the other side. One day you'll hang your sword on the shimmering wall of the city of God and you'll be able to walk within its gates and see Jesus and say, this is my coronation day. And on that day, we'll be home. Heavenly Father, help us to realize that even though life doesn't always turn out like we think it should, that one day it's going to be better. One day will be our coronation day. One day we'll hang our sword on the shimmering wall of the city of God and we'll be home. Before I finish my prayer, I wonder if you would allow me to pray for you today. Just keep your head bowed for a moment. How many would say, Pastor, I'm going through a trial through something difficult, through a test, maybe physical, maybe financial, maybe a job. It could be anything. It could be emotional, a relationship. But you'd say, I'm going through a trial, and I want you to pray for me. Would you just lift your hand? Anybody like that? Hands across the room. Father, I pray that you'd help every person that is struggling, that has difficulty. God, that you would help us all to remember that one day it's going to be better, that one day we'll find that we are in heaven and it will be our coronation day. Then I wonder how many would say, Pastor, I'm not sure I'm saved. 
I need to be able to know for sure in my heart that Jesus is my Lord and Savior, that I'm going to heaven when I die. How many would say, Pastor, I need prayer for that. I'm not quite sure. Would you lift your hand? Thank you. I see your hand. Are there others, Lord? I need salvation. I need to know Jesus. Today, whether you watch online or whether you are in the room, listen closely. If you need to know for sure that Jesus is your Savior, pray something like this. Dear Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God, that you died on the cross for my sins, and that you're willing to save me if I ask. And I am asking right now, come into my life and save me. In Jesus' name, before we say amen, I wonder if you'd say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer today and received Jesus. Would you raise your hand? I see your hand. God bless you. Thank you. Here's what I'd ask you to do, whether online or in the room. I, I hope you will fill out the next step card and let us know so that we can rejoice with you and you can be confident that you are going to heaven when you die. And all God's people said, amen, amen. We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision, you can do so by clicking the give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.